as, as something that doesn't belong in your cost accounting. It's quite clear that we are ignoring the true costs associated with environmental trends that are threatening our future. Just go down the list. The increased intensity of tropical storms and floods. Deadly heat waves tied to escalating CO2 levels. The devastating consequences of offshore oil spills and the growing number of endangered and vanishing species. We've not turned a single one of those around. Nature is the timekeeper. It is nature that, that determines the tipping points beyond which change becomes irreversible. Unfortunately, we can't see the clock, so we don't know exactly how much time is left. Many years ago, I wrote a book entitled The 29th Day. The title of the book comes from a French riddle that's used to teach school children exponential growth. You have a pond, and the first day it has one lily pad in it. The second day, two lily pads, and then four, then eight. And each day, the lily pads keep doubling. If the pond fills on the 30th day, when is it half full? The 29th day. Though only a children's riddle, for those who believe there's more than enough time to cope with a rapidly warming planet, let's go back and take another look at the pond. Let's say on the 20th day. Everything seems pretty normal. The number of lily pads are barely noticeable. And as the days increase, the pond becomes a sanctuary a place dotted with pretty flowers and with more than enough room for local wildlife. By the time we reach the 29th day, there's still plenty of room. The pond is only half filled with lily pads, so maybe we'll make plans to do a bit of fishing the next day. The only problem is, on the next day, the pond is full of lily pads and will soon become a choking mass of dying vegetation, unable to provide a safe haven for wildlife. The question we now have to ask ourselves is simply this. Has our planet already reached the 29th day? I think we've done more than reach the 29th day. I think we are well into it. We're on an accelerating curve of change. It's always hard with climate change to know exactly where you are and when the next molecule of carbon emitted into the atmosphere will tip the whole system into all kinds of feedbacks that we can't even predict or understand. The point at which you see change may be too late. The point at which the system has already started to change, you may not be able to stop those changes. There's clearly a precipice out there, somewhere. The problem is that you don't see it until you've dropped off the edge. The bottom line is that the fossil fuel-based, automobile-centered, throwaway economy is no longer a viable model for us or anyone else. It's clear that business as usual will not take us much further. And the alternative to business as usual is plan B. Plan B has four components. One is cutting carbon emissions 80% by 2020. Two, stabilizing population at no more than eight billion. Three, eradicating poverty. And fourth, restoring the Earth's natural systems. That includes forests, soils, grasslands, aquifers, fisheries, and so forth. 
these components of Plan B are all tightly linked and integrated. In order to achieve one of them, we have to achieve the others. We, we, we can't sort of pick and choose. This is not a menu. This is a comprehensive, integrated plan. We have to move forward on all four at the same time. The population issue seems to have fallen off the table in recent years. We don't pay that much attention to it, but if we can't stabilize the world's population, we're probably not going to be able to stabilize climate. If we're going to have another two and a half billion people in the next 30 to 50 years, climate had better be good. Because if it's not, it is going to be a Herculean job trying to feed those people and provide them with access to fresh water. To slow population growth, we must also find a way to eradicate poverty. We have to remember that three billion people on this planet survive on less than two dollars a day. Somewhere around one to one and a half billion survive on less than a dollar a day. It's very easy for the billion or so people in rich countries to forget exactly what life is like for the three to four billion very poor people on this planet. One of the reasons that eradicating poverty is one of the four components of Plan B is that it holds the key to many other things. It holds the key to stabilizing population. And by eradicating poverty, we mean investing in people. Bangladesh is one of the success stories of the effort that's been going on really since the 1960s to make good quality family planning and reproductive health care available to everyone who wants it. What makes Bangladesh's success so remarkable is that it's one of the world's most densely populated countries. It's where 170 million people, over half the population of the United States, are crammed into an area the size of Wisconsin. When people started working on health in, in rural communities in Bangladesh, family size was up around six or seven. Today it's half that, and still gradually trending down. That success is also the result of the government's investment in education, especially for girls. In every society for which we have data, as the level of female education rises, the size of families shrinks. Women and girls are the ones who are disproportionately impacted by poverty around the world, but also are the ones that can have the greatest impact on catalyzing change within communities. Throughout Bangladesh, trained healthcare workers meet with women in rural villages and urban settings. Their sole purpose is to discuss family planning and encourage mothers to send their children to school. If you educate a girl, she's more likely to marry later, have fewer children, her children are more likely to get an education, and so you, you really create um, a virtuous cycle that starts by changing the life of a girl who becomes a woman and having an impact on whole communities. Bangladesh is not the only place where the empowerment of women has made an impact on reducing poverty and stabilizing population. Istanbul is the thriving commercial and tourist hub of Turkey. Yet it has all the contradictions of a modern metropolis. A megacity with extreme wealth juxtaposed against impoverished immigrant neighborhoods. Until recently, the community of Esenyurt was an economic and environmental nightmare. Life was particularly difficult for women. Only 7% held jobs and it was unheard of 
for a woman to own property. One of the more exciting development ideas that's uh, had a big impact on women's lives is the idea that banks provide credit to poor and marginalized women, make them responsible for what they do with the money, make them responsible for repaying the loans. This is often called microcredit. For the women of Essenyurt, the benefits of microcredit loans were enormous. It gave Ayesha Savas the freedom to start a career. With a $350 microcredit loan, she opened a cafe. It changed her life forever. Ayeshe not only owns her own business, she has helped scores of other women get microcredit loans. Microcredit is one of these win-win strategies that actually makes me really hopeful about the future of population and the environment. It tends to have multiple benefits that kind of ripple out from a woman to her family, to her community, to a nation, to the world as a whole. Eradicating poverty is also one of the keys to protecting the diversity of life on the planet. One of the things we see in Africa, and particularly sub-Saharan Africa, where roughly 800 million people live and where populations are growing very fast, is that there's a growing protein hunger. And because of that, people are turning to wildlife as, as a source of, of meat in their diets. This is the so-called bushmeat trade. It has emerged over the last decade or two as a major threat to virtually all the mammal species in, in Africa. Thirty-five years ago, Zambia's Luangwa Valley was declared a 3,000-square-mile protected sanctuary for over 90,000 elephants. But when drought and famine overwhelmed the local farmers, the elephant population was hunted for food and tusks until their numbers dropped to fewer than 15,000. And as poverty deepened, nothing could stop the slaughter. In the face of poverty, people will tend to utilize whatever they can to survive, and that makes perfect sense. Our job as conservationists is to try and create environments where sustainable management is possible, where people can see things from a larger scale and learn how to manage things, not just at the household level, but work collaboratively to manage things at a landscape level. Villagers were taught modern farming techniques and offered economic incentives. In return, they had to stop poaching. But there was one other condition. The farmers had to turn in their snares and guns. Since we've done this, we've had over 30,000 snares turned over. Hundreds of guns have been turned in because farmers have seen that by new ways of managing their agricultural output and new marketing strategies, they don't need to poach. The results are impressive. By bringing a community out of poverty, farmers achieved food security, the elephant population increased, and ecotourism became a new source of income. If we want developing countries to cooperate in protecting forests and protecting endangered species, all the things that we need to do to create a sustainable global civilization we simply have to address the poverty issue. But beyond that, the challenge is to stabilize climate before climate change becomes irreversible, where we cannot stop global warming, where it spirals out of control. One of the most powerful signs of change is the growing grassroots movement opposing the largest source of CO2 emissions in the world, coal-fired power plants. This is the most dangerous thing on Earth. A coal-fired power plant operating just the way it's supposed to operate destroys this planet. 
Recently, thousands of demonstrators gathered in front of a coal-burning power plant located in the heart of Washington, D.C. Their goal was to bring public awareness to the link between global warming and the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. We adults told our children to clean up their rooms, but look at the toxic mess we're leaving our children to clean up. Shame on us! Shame on us! The emotional call against coal